Malcolm Gladwell is about to publish a book. He's done it four times before. Whenever it happens, huge things occur. Millions of copies get sold. Policymakers use them to shape our world. Things change when Gladwell writes a book. Sometimes for good, sometimes not so good. Malcolm. Hello. Is this is the keys. Ah. Why haven't you got a doorbell? I never got around. All this while Gladwell leads a really small life, he says, as a semi-recluse here in New York's West Village. His new book is David and Goliath. It's about the power of the underdog. Malcolm? Yes. Oh, come on. Well, oh, OK. One more. Our lives are based on lopsided conflicts, he says, and often it's the one you least expect who comes out on top. David and Goliath is full of uplifting stories about the secret power of underdogs. When you read it, you feel like you can topple giants. The funny thing is, and nobody really talks about this much, some of his earlier stories seemed really anti-underdog. Who is Malcolm Gladwell? And why does he write the things he does? Do you get, do you get nervous before you've got a book coming out? Um, uh, no, not really. I mean, the hard work is all done. Mm. There'll be some people who hate it, there'll be some people who really like it, and there'll be some people in the middle. I mean, it's always the same. It's not... There's no, there's no longer any kind of great uncertainty about how... You don't get nervous like, how is it going to be received and what kind of ripples might come from it? Because, I mean, when I've got a book coming out, I, I'm anxious about everything. I'm anxious to, you know, are people going to like it? Um, have I, have I, you know, have I peaked? Um, have I got anything wrong? Did this not cross your mind? You might have more anxiety than me. I mean, the free world's not hanging in the balance. Lives won't be lost if I get a bad review, <laughs> you know I mean? Yeah. I consider myself so far ahead of my own expectations. I am, a, you know, like that wonderful expression, you're playing with the house's money. I'm playing with the house's money. When I first heard that Gladwell's new book was about underdogs, I guessed it must be autobiographical. His father was a maths professor from Seven Oaks, Kent. His mother was a psychotherapist from Jamaica and he grew up the only mixed-race kid in a predominantly Mennonite farming town in Ontario. He made his name at The New Yorker with his essay, The Tipping Point. It was about how social changes are like viruses. Just as how someone with flu can start an epidemic, so can a few hipsters wearing hush puppies turn around the fortunes of the shoemaker, or a small change in policing can make a whole city behave well. Gladwell gave the world the 10,000-hour rule, too. How the Beatles and Bill Gates got that way by practising for 10,000 hours. He'd take esoteric academic research and turn it into good stories with self-improvement messages. And now, it's David and Goliath. The basic idea is that our accounting of battles, our accounting is unsophisticated. People who appear to be... Um, underdogs have far more resources than is immediately obvious. And that what looks like power is very often something with profound limitations. Um, and so I tell a series of stories that bring those points out. I have a chapter about dyslexia, which asks the question about whether you would wish dyslexia on your child, which seems like an absurd proposition, but then huge numbers of Entrepreneurs are dyslexic. Richard Branson, I mean, the list is literally this long. And if you ask them about how they made it to where they made it, they will always say not, it happened not in spite of their disability, but because of it. Because what because doesn't kill you makes you stronger? If you can't read and you're in school and you want to make it, what do you do? What do you learn to do? Well, you learn to cheat. <laughs> But what is cheating? Cheating is coming up with creative strategies for solving the problem in front of you, right? They all cheat. They all put together coalitions of friends to help them get through. 
they're all best friends with the smartest kid in the class starting in the second or third year of school. That you get really good at delegating oral communication. You talk your way out of every academic problem. If you abstract that and you say, okay, so if you spend your entire life doing that and you want to become an entrepreneur, you enter the world of business equipped with what skills? Skills of team building, oral communication, problem solving, and delegation, which are central to building businesses. So you see this kind of, in their stories, something really kind of rare and thrilling, which is that the response to adversity can sometimes, not always, have the effect of putting someone ahead of the game, um, ahead of someone who never had the adversity at all. I assume that Gladwell was identifying with the underdog, the David, right up until I met the person who knows him best. Bruce Hedlund was Gladwell's best friend growing up in Ontario. He's now the media editor of the New York Times. He told me something I really didn't expect. No, I, I think quite the opposite. He would see himself as a Goliath. What terrifies Malcolm, and has always terrified Malcolm, is the idea of the, the, the successful, the more dominant team falling. Uh, he's obsessed with Tiger Woods. I don't know. It's been an argument we've had our whole life. I mean, I've always ascribed my love of the underdog to kind of cheap sentimentalism. I mean, it's the kind of Hollywood uh, Mighty Ducks version uh, or Bad News Bears version. I don't know. He's always had this idea that if, if someone has attained a certain amount, like of Tiger success. Woods, of success, to watch them fail, he finds just heartbreaking. He was a competitive runner when he was younger. He was leading in a mile race, and he thought he had it in the bag. And a runner beat him right at the end. And he wasn't, he just wasn't minding it. And that drove him crazy. Tortured him, absolutely tortured him. So yeah, I would say that's a, you know, a fear a lot of successful people have. But I know in that one case, that ate him alive. When I asked Bruce, your, your best friend, he said that you're like a classic overdog. And he's, the, like when you're watching sports games, he's always rooting for the underdog, and you're always rooting for the overdog. I do, but I have a, I regard my position to be morally superior. So in a sporting contest, the underdog expects to lose. The favorite expects to win. So if the favorite loses, it is a catastrophic, emotionally heartrending loss. And the only empathetic position I realized at that tender age was to cheer for the overdog. Because you, if, you're, if your goal in life is to minimize the amount of pain that goes on in the world, right, you should always cheer for the favorite. But the underdog doing well, the kind of little guy beating the big guys, you know, it's, such a, it's, a great, it's a great story. It's a great narrative. And we all get really moved by it. Does that mean we're all being kind of completely irrational when we're rooting for the underdog? No, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I bracket sports as a very particular case where um, there's something very human about wanting in other realms the less powerful to win because it, um, it seems more just, right? You can't have people who have all of the resources win every contest because then the world no longer makes any sense. There's no point for us to go on if... The same people are always, the expected victor is always the victor. And really the book is for, because because you spend time in kind of Goliath circles, so I'm kind of assuming that the book is for both sorts of people. Do I spend time in Goliath circles? <laughs> you, well, you do, right? You, I don't know if that's true. I'm well, trying you, to think of a Goliath circle that I spend time in. Well, you give, you give these public speaking talks that kind of, you oh, know, know CEOs and... Oh, I see what you mean. Mm. Um, well, I, you know, I like, I, yes, I am a fellow traveler, I suppose, in Goliath Circles. Um, when I think of Goliath Circles, I was thinking of something quite more glamorous than my life. But um, uh, You like bodybuilders. Uh, <laughs> How did Malcolm Gladwell get to be such an overdog? These days, business conferences pay him up to $80,000 to give hour-long talks. It's been this way since the mid-90s and the tipping point. It was an admiring story about how the New York City police chief was successfully stamping out murders by fixing broken windows and declaring war on underdog misfits, teenage fair dodgers and graffiti artists. Gladwell turned it into a story about how all of us can be like New York, 
we can improve ourselves in major ways by implementing tiny changes. It was a sensation. His editor back then, the woman who plucked him from obscurity, was Tina Brown. Well, I'm always looking, I mean, I'm really turned on by it. Uh, the journalism of ideas. It's the very, very best kind of read because you're both gripped, uh, you know, by the, the sort of the viscera, but you're also uh, absolutely enlightened and, and edified by the playing out and the teasing out and the provocations of ideas. And that's what Malcolm brought. And I heard a story about you that you would, um, or you wanted to accept stories that would hold your attention when you were on the Stairmaster. Is that, is that well, you know, I have a low boredom threshold, and I, I think so do readers. And I used to say, you know, if that magazine is accumulating by the side of the bed, you, you know you've failed. And actually, Malcolm shares that for you. I mean, one of the great things about my Malcolm, he has a low boredom threshold. Malcolm always was this story fund of ideas. I mean, he always had stories he wanted to do. And it was a wonderful collaboration between us, where frequently I would find a story, and he would find the ideas that would mesh it. Are you tough? Do you actually get on a stairmaster and, and, <laughs> and somebody's like, you know, telling you a story and you go, you're boring no, me? Of course I'm not. No, no, but that. I get up early and I do exercise. And so his, his first big story was The Tipping Point. The Tipping Point was another one of these stories that kind of generated from the news. There were stories about the crime, crime surges. And I think what interested Malcolm was why? You know, what, hap why, what, what happens with a crime surge? Why is, there, why is one block OK and another block not OK? In 1992, there were 2,154 murders in New York City and 626,182 serious crimes. It was a dangerous city, which people forget. It was a very dangerous city, and crime was just what you live with every day. The scream of those police sirens was part of the music of one's night. And, uh, you know, I look back on that time and think, you know, what a kind of, it was a very dirty place. But then something strange happened. At some mysterious and critical point, the crime rate began to turn. It tipped. Within five years, murders had dropped 64.3% to 770, and total crimes had fallen by almost a half to 355,000. Somehow, an awful lot of people in New York got infected with an anti-crime virus in a short time. That story, Headed the Tipping Point, was published in The New Yorker and really was an instant success because it was the story that got Malcolm an agent and immediately that book got sold. And really, from there, he just took off instantly as a kind of cultural phenomenon. There's no question that New York is one of the safest cities in the world now. I've been writing about the crime story here for a while, and I've had my doubts about the position that Gladwell took in the book that made him famous. The zero-tolerance approach created in the 90s by Mayor Giuliani and his police chief, William Bratton, had a name. They called it Broken Windows. A few months ago, I was working on a story in the Bronx and I met a defence lawyer up there. I said to her, isn't it amazing that those tiny policing changes made such a huge difference? A dark look crossed her face. She said, you got that from reading Gladwell, right? Now I'm going back to the Bronx to meet her again. Crime dropped, policing practices changed, but there's just no data causally linking them. No, just no connection. Major crime decreased. It decreased precipitously through the 90s, um, through Giuliani's two terms in office. So Giuliani and his police chief must have said, well, this is because of our broken windows policy. Absolutely, wouldn't you? I mean, that's a natural yeah. connection to make. Yeah. There have been numerous studies that have attempted to prove the theory that it was New York's policing practices that caused the drop in crime. The Atlantic published an article by a sociologist named David Greenberg. He went through all of the studies, you know, so far that have attempted to prove this causal link and he concluded again, the data isn't there. But it seems that what the new aggressive policing did cause was the criminalizing of a generation 
for the slightest offences. People were getting